Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ted. I'm an alcoholic. Really glad to be here. Wow, thank you. (laughs) Let's see. So about 13 years ago, I spoke at Living Sober at the Bill Graham, and the first speaker um, spoke. They said, we're going to take an an intermission, and everybody left. And nobody came back in. And they said, just get up there, Ted, and start speaking. I said, but nobody's here. And so I was having that feeling again when, when they said they're going to take an inter- intermission. I said, oh, well, oh, well. No, <laughs> I'm, I said yes, and I'm willing to be of service. Maximum, what I heard earlier from Eric, thank you, um, just to be of service. Whatever happens, happens. So, wow, I really can't see anybody, so that's kind of annoying, but I feel like I just lost my vision. Uh, <laughs> So I can see my sister and my brother. I really appreciate them being here tonight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) My brother is visiting from uh, Oklahoma, Norman, Oklahoma. And uh, the first time he's been in in, uh, to hear me share. So there's a little bit of anxiety about that. My sister is uh, currently eight years sober and has heard, (laughs) heard me share more than I can believe. My sponsee, Steve, is here. Um, he's 30 years sober, and he came from Honolulu to hear me share right there. Always probably on the phone in the hall. <laughs> and uh, so I met Steve in his third meeting 30 years ago, and I've been working the steps with him continuously for all that time. And um, it's, it's been fabulous. So I really want to thank the, Teresa. What a, what a gem. Um, what a miracle to see you and to get that call from you. That was amazing. Um, and all the committee and the people on the committees that do all the work to put these things together. I know it's not easy getting along with everybody and, um, <laughs> and cooperate. I have not ever been on one of the Living Sober uh, committees, but I've sponsored a lot of guys on them. And I feel like I should get credit for that. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of work sponsoring people through this just to get them not to quit and uh, to learn what the word commitment means. And so that's amazing. Um, that's it. Uh, there was something else. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, the timekeeper, I can see you. Okay, good deal. Um, so I'm sober 32 years. My sobriety date is 1185. Oh, let's see. I was born in Denver, but I was raised in um, Lawton, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. There. I know we're not supposed to, we don't like to declare anybody an alcoholic, but we have to sometimes. <laughs> That's what my sponsor told me. He said, we don't like it. It doesn't mean we don't. Um, but, um, so I, I was full of fear. I was the only queer I knew in, in Oklahoma, and uh, I was raised in a Catholic uh, situation. Um, <laughs> I've done those inventories, and uh, I've forgiven the nuns. Actually, they've forgiven me. And um, I'll t- if I get to that story, I have a really good uh, night step amends about that. But um, So I started drinking at age 15. I was full of fear and alcohol, tall coors. My brother was um, eight, two years older than me, and I have a sister five years older than me, and I have a brother a year older than me. And they had already um, started partying. So it was easy for me to fall into it at age 15. They already had the stuff. My brother seemed to have all the connections and all the friends. And so it was really easy for me. And um, I started drinking because I was full of fear. And it was the elixir for my fear. It was my solution for a long time. So um, it was during the Vietnam era. I was I graduated from high school in 1969. I had been drunk as much as possible for the, for the last three years, um, from age 15 to 18. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I, got, I, I went to one year at Cameron Agricultural College, and because ROTC was mandatory, I dropped out. 
And then I won the lottery for the draft for Vietnam, and I got a number 53. Now, for the reason they, they drafted my older brother, and then my other brother joined the Marines to get out of the draft. He's not the smartest one in the family. <laughs> but expect to get drafted. I don't know why. I just had alcoholic thinking. It's not going to happen to me. The next thing I know, I came out of a blackout, and I was in fatigues at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. My head was shaved. I had a rifle, and I was, they were going to make a man out of me. <laughs> they failed. Uh, at least, you know, I used to tell my, my sponsees I'm a trained killer, because <laughs> I, I did go through basic training, and, uh, but I, I mean, the signs of my alcoholism were really apparent, really right away. I was uh, just shut down emotionally, and, and if I could just get a drink, I would be okay. And uh, they, they like to yell at you, and, you know, my attitude was, what are you going to do, draft me? I mean... <laughs> I'm already here, you know. So when they say drop down and give me 20, I would just lay down. <laughs> you know, but what are they going to do? They got a hundred guys they got to keep in line, and I'm, they're going to spend how much time on me? And so they're yelling and, and uh, using the rifle butt for motivation, but I wasn't going to do a fucking push up. So, uh, you know, so then. Uh, it, that's the way I was. You know, I was on the obstacle course, and all these guys were real men, and they were uh, charging at this, this, uh, wood wall and they would just go ah, and claw up the thing and climb over and fall down the other side and crawl through the mud under the wire and I oh no <laughs> I, I, I have a blister on my hand <laughs> and I can't do that and, and, and then I go hey there's a path right around here around the wall and I just told me there's a path here and so I go around and I'm already looking for an easier softer way and it just didn't make sense. None of it made sense. I thought this is, and you know, the, the destination was Vietnam is what I assumed. Everybody assumed that. And everybody was living in a state of fear. And uh, so they put me in a circle of men, 100 men, yeah. And they were going to teach us how to fight. And they put each one of us in. And they had pugo sticks, I think, pugo sticks, I guess that's the call. And they had leather things on the end, and you hit each other with them. And so they, they blow a whistle, and two men go in, and I went in, and then another guy. And then uh, they hit me, and I fall down real fast, you know. <laughs> I just, I didn't want to play, but, and they go, kill, kill. And then, just, oh, I started laughing. I thought, really? You're going to take this seriously? And I just fall down. And so I, my turn was over very quickly, and I got up to walk away, and... Um, they blew the whistle and said, you stay in the center, and you're going to stay in the center until you learn how to fight. I thought, oh, this is going to be a long day, <laughs> and I just need a drink, really. Um, so man after man came, out, came in and knocked me down until they dislocated my shoulder, and, uh, I, and, and they were yelling at me to get up and fight, and I, in my rage, finally that pent-up rage came out, and I started swearing at them, and... Um, told him my arm was broken because I didn't know what was wrong. And this, I tell the story because it was a turning point in my life. The, um, they, they sent me to the hospital, and they took me in and laid me on a gurney and hung weights on my arm to pop my shoulder back into place, and they gave me morphine. And I had not had a drink in two months. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, thank you. I would join the Army again for that. <laughs> you know, just for that. And I thought, Vietnam, here I come. I, I, I already got some opiates. I'm ready to go. Um, I mean, it was sweet. And uh, as a result of that, I, I was placed in a holding situation called the zoo, which a lot of misfits. I talked my way out of that, went back to a different company. And the new company I went with uh, got stateside orders, and the, the old company all went to Vietnam. So just there was an intervention in my life that, I, you know, seemingly bad, leading to the good. And I got sent to the Presidio of San Francisco. <laughs> wow, I know. <laughs> I thought, are you kidding me? Where is that? <laughs> I didn't even know where it was. I had to look it up on the map, go to the library and look it up. Uh, I didn't know where San Francisco was. I had clipped out of the Time magazine in 1968 a little article about homosexuals, and in it, there was a picture of a gay bar, and it just had silhouettes of men. And it said, there's homosexuals in San Francisco. So I did know that. <laughs> so I came out here looking. 
<laughs> but I came out here and I drove my VW Bug across town and I, I was really, you know, three days it took me because I had to drink. And um, I stopped at Flagstaff, Arizona, and they saw me coming. These two gas station attendants, 18 years old, came out and offered me a joint. I smoked. I got high. They sold me four new tires because they convinced me the tires were leaking air. I mean, that's how naive I was. You could tell me anything. You could have sold me the bridge. I mean, it was just that I was just, I believed anything. I got to California. I couldn't find my way out in that left-hand turn from Lombard into the Presidio. So I got a case of beer and checked into a Lombard hotel. And just, I said, I'll check in later, like it was a resort. And uh, they were really upset. I was a day late. So what? Um, they got used to it. Um, I was in the Army for two years, something like that, uh, a medical record specialist at the Letterman Hospital. I had called my family back in Oklahoma, said I wasn't, if you want to see me, you have to come out here. I'm never going back to that state again. I um, started partying um, in, this, in this Army. I was drunk all the time. They told me not to come into work. It was an embarrassment. They told me I was a disgrace to the uniform, and so I just come in to work uh, after 6 p.m. when everyone was gone, and I didn't have to wear a uniform anymore. Just come in and do my short time and get out. So I got out of the Army and moved into um, out near the avenues on 47th Avenue because uh, I wanted to be near the ocean. I was still delusional. And uh, <laughs> I thought it was sunny out there, or would be someday. And uh, I, I was waiting. I just thought if I could just so get sober, it might get sunny, but that didn't happen. Uh, so I moved out there and with the, another guy that drank as much as I did. Anyway, I was, in, I was out of the Army in 1973, and I drank in San Francisco from 1973 to 1980. And I just drank. I discovered the Castro. Then I discovered the Buena Vista Park. Then I discovered hate. Then I discovered the trip over the Buena Vista Park to the Castro <laughs> through the park. Then I just stayed in the park and uh, <laughs> and stayed in the hate. You know, my life got narrow. They talk about it. I always think of that trick. People say, where were you? And I, I was in Buena Vista Park uh, the weekend. And uh, they said, where were you all weekend? I said, I was camping. <laughs> you know? I was in nature. That's all I could think of. Uh, so the, 70, the 70s flew by. I don't remember a lot of it. I remember the I-beam. I remember my brother visited once, from, and we drank a whole week. Um, I remember I tried to push my boyfriend out of the window at that visit, and um, Rod yelled at me, told me to leave him alone. And uh, it was only on the second floor. He wouldn't have gotten hurt. <laughs> but, but, I was encouraging him to jump because I knew it was just a second floor jump. It wouldn't hurt, it would hurt him, but not bad. So um, what he told me later, he thought he was faking jumping and the fire escape was there, but he was at the wrong window. Uh, so that would have been uh, one of those things that happens when you're drinking. So um, in 1973, I started at City College on the GI Bill, and I graduated in 1984. <laughs> So I got my two-year RN uh, in 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. So what happened was I was in the hate, and I was, on, you know, I considered Hate Street my living room. I had a, hundred, a, a studio apartment on Page Street for $140 a month. I know. I couldn't even pay that rent. I had to steal that money. You know, I, I didn't... I. I was a frequent at all the bars on Hate Street. I used to wear, a, uh, actually wore it back home once to Oklahoma, a football jersey with 86 on it because I was 86 so often from the, the bars. And they'd always, I'd walk in and go, 86. And so I thought, oh, cute, I'll wear the shirt. And <laughs> just like acknowledge that I have the shirt on. And uh, so it's, if, I don't know if there's any newcomers here. If You could clap if you're under 30 days. Wow. Okay, yay, congratulations. I'm, I'm going to try to keep in mind the newcomers listening. And um, for me, the definition of an alcoholic is someone that's lost the ability to control their drinking. That's what happened to me. Without knowing the book, without knowing the program lingo, I, I just lost the ability to control. I didn't know what was going to happen. If I took a drink, I didn't know if it was going to be a weekend out in a blackout or, or it would be just, just nothing. So I never knew what was going to happen, so I lost the ability to control it. 
And that's my definition of alcoholic. When you study the book and you'll learn that the definition in doctor's opinion is I have an allergy of the body and an obsession of the mind, and that is how he defines alcoholism. And that's great, but when you're not in AA and you don't know AA language, you just keep going out to the bar and you teach. For myself, the last three years of the 70s, I tried to control my drinking so I could get through nursing school. And I hadn't even gotten accepted in. I was doing the prereqs for nursing. And I just wanted to do that. And I'll tell you, it was another alcoholic decision. I don't really care about people that much. Uh, <laughs> and I, I read, I'm really not that compassionate. I don't really care if you hurt. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, they used to give me a hug. No, I don't want to. Um, so I was just, I thought if I went to nursing school, I would learn to be a nice person. I would learn the skill of being compassionate, the skill. So, um, yeah, I didn't. I found out nursing school was about controlling what goes in, what comes out, when they get up, when they get down. I keep in control. I love that. So I became a psych nurse. Uh, <laughs> I had two therapeutic interventions, restraints and medication. I worked at the San Francisco General um, Somebody asked me once, did you do amends to all those patients yet? No. Uh, but if you're out there, come talk to me. Um, <laughs> so I did that. I, that was my, my first job was a psych tech in the jail unit at 7D in San Francisco General. I worked as a psych tech through nursing school. And I knew that I could not. I had tried to work with adolescent children, psych patients, Drinking and those kids will tear you up when you've got a hangover. So I thought, this is, I have to quit drinking if I'm going to work in this kind of an env environment. So I went to 18th Street Services because I heard somebody told me about it. And I had made a promise not to drink in 1980. That was my New Year's resolution in 1980. And I said, if I drink again, which I always did, that I would get help. And so in nine, in two, three months later, I drank again. I, my, my, best record was three months on my own. And so I, I drank again, and I went to 18th Street Service. It was called Good Lands Above the Bad Lands in the Castro. And Bill B. was my counselor, and he was a great guy, and they don't really do AA, but they do um, education about alcoholism and how it affects your body. And it's a wonderful program, and a lot of people went through it that are still sober. And um, I owe a lot to that. But at the end of three months, Bill said to me, Ted, what's your plan to stay sober? And I said, oh, I'm going to go to the I-beam every night and dance. And he said, that might not work. I said, this is the longest I've ever been sober. It's working great. And he said, well, why don't you go to AA? And I said, I hate AA. And he said, what do you hate about it? And I said, well, they don't drink. <laughs> I mean, I don't ha I mean, you know, I'm always explaining myself to people, you don't understand, I don't drink. I mean, they don't drink, so I don't hang out with them. I don't hang out with people that don't drink. So he said, well, you, you like to dance, and they're having a, a dance at the Living Sober Conference, 1980. He said, and it was at Fort Mason in one of the hangars. And I, and I said, oh, really? And I, so I, I met this guy, he had 24 hours sober. And <laughs> so I helped him. I, <laughs> I'm a helper at heart. Uh, so I went to his house and dumped out his booze and lectured him. And I uh, took him to the dance. And we were slam dancing in 1980. We were. Nobody else was. But <laughs> I just got the knack of it. He picked me up and swirled me around and hit everybody on the dance floor. I, and they were very nice about it. So I thought, these people are pretty cool. Uh, and they were very good looking. They had decorated the place with white parachutes and big bouquets of flower. And it was impressive. And I thought, wow, this is AA. It's great. I've never been to dance like that since. But they had a great big... <laughs> That's how they hook you. It had a great big, great big disco ball and good music and hot man. And I thought, this is great. And then someone said, you want to go to an AA meeting? Oh, yeah. This sounds great. So I went to the one-liners on Fell Street. And uh, this guy, Larry S., had a notorious reputation for being a 13th stepper, a stepper. So I followed him around for, for weeks and kept introducing myself to him as new. I even lied and said I could jog the eight miles that he was going to jog the next day. And so I went on Thursday night, I told him I was a jogger. And on fr Saturday morning, I went to his house to uh, jog. And uh, the other newcomer came out of his bedroom. 
And I thought, shit, they work fast around here. <laughs> I mean, what, what I had done was take my bar mentality into AA and not want to change it. And I stayed in AA for four years, doing it my way, chasing guys, sitting in the back row, making fun of the speakers, and going to nursing school, learning how to be a good, compassionate person. <laughs> and getting a job that paid well. Um, so I graduated from nursing school. I had a job at San Francisco General in 7B and the psych unit, and I was really thinking my life was going to get together. The only thing is I was a little bit irritable. That, that's how I described it. Um, I was really didn't like a lot of people, and I told you what I thought uh, a lot, and I, I, I just wasn't going to be fake anymore. <laughs> Now that I'm sober, I'm going to tell the truth. Yeah. And so I was telling the truth a lot, and a lot of people told me their truth. And the truth was they didn't like me very much. And I had a newcomer I was hanging out with, because I did hang out with newcomers, because they're the only people that would tolerate me. And uh, I was hanging out with this guy, and, and he suggested we socialize with some AA guys. And I said, no, I don't do that. And he said, you know, Ted, you're in a bo an, an emotional basket case. You would be better off drinking. This is from a newcomer, and I had, I had a couple years at that time, so I got mad, never spoke with him. Um, so I, I graduated from school, I went to a meeting, and I went to a meeting because my friend Susan, who had been in nursing school with me, asked me to go to a meeting with her to give the guy that was speaking dirty looks. And she asked me to come out of the, be the back row and sit in the front row and, and give the speaker dirty looks because he was 14 years sober and he was dating Jean who had seven months. So he was a 13-stepper. Got it? And so well, that's bad. So I knew, I knew several things about AA. I know who stole the treasury, who made bad coffee, who was, who was a little bit scary, and, and absolutely who slept with who and who, who just broke up with who. I knew all the bar stuff, the important stuff. I didn't care about the steps or anything. So I went to this meeting, and this guy was speaking, and he was loud, and he was arrogant, and he was English, so I became very Irish. He was heterosexual womanizer, so I became very gay, not a stretch, but, <laughs> but he did get my attention because he was loud, and he had, now I call it the confidence of his convictions. Back then, I called it arrogance, but um, he said, the answer to all your problems are in this book, so for the one newcomer that clapped, the answer to all your problems are in this book. And I'm sitting there talking to myself, as most people do in AA meetings. They have a running dialogue about what the speaker says. If you like me, you talk back to them. And, well, I haven't read that book, and my problems aren't in that book, and I have they wouldn't put my gay story in that book. I'm just going having a good time. <laughs> and uh, listening to myself, that's what kept me sick. And so I was really angry at this guy. I had not shared an AA meeting in four years, except in the back row with the newcomers to make fun of people. And uh, he's, but he, I, I was so mad at him. I was so angry at his arrogance. And so I raised my hand. And he called on me, because I'm sitting there giving him dirty looks for 40 minutes, and he's noticed me. And so he called on me, and I, I said, I haven't done the, I haven't read the book, I haven't sponsored people, I haven't done the steps, and I just graduated from nursing school, and I just jogged eight miles, and I, and I, I probably was going to Weight Watchers at the time, I reported my way. I gave everybody my resume of how good I was doing, and he cut me off in the middle of my share, which is, you don't do that. <laughs> so, and uh, he said, you're on borrowed time, you're going to drink again. And all I could think of, no crosstalk. Because <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's the first thing we learn in AA, to keep those old timers from talking nonsense to us. No crosstalk, I'm, I'm in my process. So I'm going to have my own process. And uh, anyway, he became my sponsor. And immediately he gave me his card and said, call me if you're interested in joining AA. And I said, didn't you hear me? I've been going to AA for four years. I just graduated from nursing school. I work as AA. I heard you. He said, and we love visitors. <laughs> and you've been visiting for a long time, but why don't you join AA? And this is what you want every newcomer to ask you. How do you do that? How do you join AA? And he said, you do the steps and you help somebody else. That's how you become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. 
So at that moment, after four years of hanging around the fringes of AA, I was invited to join AA. So if no one's invited you to join AA, I, I always invite you to join Alcoholics Anonymous. It's going to be a trudge. It's not going to be easy. You have to get really up close and personal with a lot of people, and they're going to tell you the truth about yourself. And, and that's from sponsees. <laughs> <laughs> It's not strangers. It's sponsees. That's the best way to learn about yourself. So um, I went, I, this guy became my sponsor, and uh, he gave. He said, you got a month to do your fourth step. And I said, well, wait a minute. That's kind of rushing it. He said, you've been here four years. <laughs> How sick do you want to stay? He said, you're very sick. You need to do the steps right away. This is a life or death matter. He, everything to him was a life and death matter. I mean, really, everything. And he'd say, Ted, you and I are in the business of saving lives. With your dark past, you're going to be able to help others avoid misery and death. If you haven't read the book and someone starts talking to you that way, you follow him. Because I think that guy's pretty smart. He can see that I'm a really helpful person. <laughs> So I went to, I, he gave me a month to do my fourth step. I went out to his house because I was willing to go to any lengths. I went to Daly City. <laughs> really, you, uh, the pride I took in that. I took the BART to Daly City. I mean, who would do that? And so my willingness was just everywhere. I was so willing. And then when I got to his house, he says, let's kneel down and do the third step. I said, oh, but the floor is dirty. <laughs> I'm willing to go so far. I, I, I was embarrassed for him because he wanted to pray. On a, uh, and, you know, I said, uh, you forgot the part of trust God, clean house. Uh, and <laughs> this, you know, he had dog and cat, and both were shedding like, like it was m midsummer. And uh, I was like, then he threw some raw hamburger, and he said, I'll pick something to eat while you read. And I said, I'm not hungry when I saw that. And I saw his kitchen. And so I, he just, he started right off. He said, tell me why you haven't done a four step in four years. And I said, because it says now about sex. And I'll tell you the truth, I'm not talking about sex. And he, and so he did what every good sponsor does. He, he tried to put me at ease by telling me about his sex life. I was horrified. <laughs> and he's a straight man that's just about done everything. And I'm like, oh, you don't, oh, it's okay. Keep some things to yourself. You know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay. You don't have to. But he was trying to put me at ease, and I was horrified. And then he said to me, important thing, he said, the first instruction for you is to go, write the word should, cross it out, and put that on the refrigerator, because you're shooting yourself and you're shooting me. You've got this rules and regulations about what everybody should be doing, and I, you've got to get rid of that. He said, and then, he said, now tell me about your sex life, and I told him that I was quite promiscuous. That's as simple as I would put it. Uh, in a general way, I very was general. I said I was quite promiscuous with a lot of people uh, for 10 years. <laughs> and he said, wow, um, okay. He said, this is the case. Your sex powers are God-given, they're for good. I want you to start in, uh, enjoying your sex life. I want you to put an empty chair next to the bed and invite God in to watch the show. Oh. <laughs> I thought, now all my Catholic stuff comes up. <laughs> I'm like, you're going to hell. <laughs> I don't want to hear this. And he's really talking about this. Like, you're going to invite God in to every aspect of my life. I thought, oh, no, this guy. And then he goes, he's really scary. I, he, I read all my inventory about all my siblings and all my principles that I resented against politics, all tons of politics. And then, because I was a, a, really just a drunk, but I, I justified it with politics. And... Um, when I got under all that. So at the end, he goes, uh, Dad, because that's how he talks to God. He goes, Dad, what are we going to do with Ted? And I'm a psych nurse. I think you're nuts. <laughs> you know, I'm getting, I'm looking for some meds. Uh, and, he goes, he goes, and then he goes, okay. And, and he goes, okay. <laughs> he, says, he, got a, he goes, we got a plan between me and God and you. This is our plan. I'm just really sus suspicious now. And he said, I said, what is, it, what is that plan? And uh, he's, oh, first he said, tell me what you want, don't want to tell anyone. And I said, I used poppers in a sexual situation two months ago. And he said, what are poppers? I said, nothing. <laughs> What's Robitussin? Nothing. <laughs> Eight bottles worth of no nothing. <laughs> So I did poppers in a sexual situation two months ago after my father died. I thought it was justified. And he said, is it a drug? I said, I don't think so. 
And he said, what is it? And, you know, I'm a nurse. What is it? I don't know what that st stuff is. I said, it makes you dance better and <laughs> helps you with sex. And he goes, you're not even sober. This is fantastic. I, wa I wasn't that happy. But uh, he said, this is fantastic. I said, this is the plan. I came up with me and God and you. You're going to get out of the half measure section in the back row. You're going to sit in the ICU in the front row. And you're going to raise your hand at every meeting and say, my way doesn't work. And you're going to start over. Your new sobriety date is 1185. I said, I don't like that date. I said, then people think I made a New Year's resolution. He said, I don't care. He said, any plan will work as long as it's not your own. That was really important for me to know. Stand up for something or you'll fall for anything. Don't take a public opinion. Act for finding the sickest people. They agree with you, and that's two people that stay sick. So that's how I was sponsored. <clears throat> High Noon was my home group. I'm proud to say I love that group. I went to High Noon, and that's where I learned to grow up. I did commitments, I fought with people, I, I just did all the stuff you do. you do. You do AA wrong for a long time if you're lucky, and you get to stay here and grow up. That's, I've heard it said, the big book can be summed up in two words, grow up. Trudge. I mean, we, we, I know a lot of trudgers here tonight. I mean, I see people that have been through hell and stayed sober, and I admire all of you so much. I mean, I know for myself it's been not an easy road, but as my sponsor always said, it's a seemingly bad leading to the good. And he's always said that to me. And, uh, you know, I, was, I, I did AA, and I stayed sober for maybe the first seven years on, on a lot of activity, a lot of intrusive bullying, judging, criticizing other people's program, invading meetings with my sponsees and telling everybody they're doing it wrong, but our way is the right way. It was kind of like, it was, I stayed sober, but when I look back on it, it was cringeworthy. It was like, wow, you were really an asshole. <laughs> and my sponsor isn't known, you know, everybody says, wow, he's such an asshole, but he helps a lot of people, you know, that, and when they start saying that about you, well, you're a jerk, but you help a lot of people. It's not, that's not enough, you know, I wanted to, I didn't want to be like that. Then I got, I was um, in a bad situation, and I was seeing some, well, I was seeing uh, a married guy in Marin, um, and it wasn't a good situation. And I did my sex inventory on page 6970, and it said, are you concerned about arousing jealousy, bitterness, suspicion? Not if she doesn't find out. <laughs> that was my answer. You know, keep, it, keep your mouth shut, and we'll be fine. Well, that blew up. He had AIDS and, and never mentioned it to me, and uh, I came up positive. And when I called him and told him, he said, oh, don't worry, babe, I won't leave you. And he was dead in two months. And I went into a crisis, and thank God for my sponsees at the time. I, uh, I was really upset about that time. I thought I was going to lose my nursing license. I thought I was going to be employable. I had all these fears, and I had a house meeting of you know a bunch of guys, and I told them I was dying. <laughs> and I wanted them to get a new sponsor, and two of them did, and I got mad. Because <laughs> they left me in my time of need. <laughs> I said, that's what it is. I stab you in the back and leave you just when you need him. But, I mean, it was such an adventure to go through that. And when I called my sponsor and I said, I'm going on disability. I had 43 T cells. They got me 18 months to live. And I'm on the AZT. It's not working. It's making me sicker. And uh, he said, it's a seemingly bad leading to the good. Oh, I was not happy with that. I said, you know, a chance, an opportunity to let God into your life more. And I really didn't like it, but I've come to rely on his guidance and rely on the program, the principles of AA, and it's never let me down. And so I, I read, I really threw myself into it. And he said, this is an opportunity, Ted, for you don't know what. As soon as I got my uh, diagnosis and went on disability, my mother got sick and I went back to Oklahoma and took care of her for a month. And that was a gift to be with her. The one thing I probably still need to work on, she said to me as she was dying, I still think your father wouldn't have drank so much if you hadn't, if your kids had behaved better. That sent me to Al-Anon. <laughs> and my youngest brother passed away in 2004, right before I spoke at the Living Silver Conference last time. And um, 
when I went to Angeles and uh, a performer, and I wasn't very kind to him through his years of drug use and performing. And uh, he told me, we, I went down and he had a talk. He said, Ted, I would never go to AA. You're judgmental, you're self-righteous, you're, you're, you're not the kind of person I want to be around. And that was very hard to hear. But it was just exactly what I needed, seemingly bad leading to the good. I came back with the resolution to change my life, to change the way I sponsored, to change the relationship I have with God. No longer punishing, demanding, unloving God, but a God that I could really live with. I went to a, a, my first adventure into spirituality. I went to a Zen retreat in the San Jacinto Mountains with uh, 13 HIV-positive guys. And uh, they didn't tell me until we were halfway there that it was a silent retreat. <laughs> and most of the people that know me, I talk nonstop. And uh, yeah. And they could tell me on the halfway up the mountain, they said, This is a silent retreat. And I said, Why the hell didn't you tell me? They said, You wouldn't have come. I said, That's right. Uh, so I got the guys together. I got a bunch of chocolate chip cookies and some Diet Cokes. And I had a party in my room. The Zen master called me down to the courtyard and said he wanted to speak to me in the morning and uh, started lecturing. Well, he, he was nice, but he said, um, you know, your behavior is not acceptable here. You, you disturbed the whole camp all night, the whole community. And I said, well, in your, in your Dharma talk, you said to be childlike. <laughs> and he said, yes, I did, but you're very childish. And there's a difference between being childlike and childish. He said, what, why don't you try to participate? He said, you get out of this what you put into it. Now, that's the same thing my sponsor had been telling me for 12 years about AA. And I had to go down to some freezing-ass mountain yeah. and <laughs> sit in hours of silence for some guy to tell me. So, I mean, we did a Zen retreat, uh, we did a sweat lodge there, and I got a sinus infection from that shit. Uh, you know, I did a lot of, I joined a Wicca group and, and uh, a coven of seven AA members because I was protesting the discussion of uh, Christianity and uh, Christmas in an AA group, and somebody, somebody invited me to do Wicca, so I did that for a few years, had a ball, went up to the Radical Fairy Gathering and Realized I'm not a radical fairy. <laughs> that was scary. Um, I did some S and M spirituality. That was scarier, and uh, <laughs> found out that didn't suit me either. And so I came back to look for my spirituality in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is where it is for me. This is my religion. This is where my God is. Working with others, and I've been blessed. Every person I thank, every person that spent time with me and worked with me and criticized me at group level and told me I talked too much, and uh, every person that's had any advice for me, because I do listen and I do try to um, let it in. And actually, I love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I I love my family and I love my sponsees. And the people that have put up with me for the years, it's 32 years. I see people at the meeting here, and that living sober really takes me back to a lot of memories. I mean, I wasn't always behaved well at this conference. I remember I took a young guy in handcuffs and a chalk strap with a leash and a dog chain and marched him around the meeting uh, to just be a jerk. And I just did not, you know, just seek attention. And that was in, in early recovery, and I, I just think, well, you know, Keep coming back, you know. <laughs> Keep coming back. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, but um, I, I've worked a lot with uh, shame and guilt. And I went down to the conference in Hawaii, and I heard Sister B, and I was really angry because they had Sister B speaking at the Hawaii conference. I said they shouldn't have a nun speaking. Blah, blah, blah. And so, but I went into the conference, and I sat in the back of the conference room, and and Sister B said, "I want to." welcome all of you that had trouble coming in here tonight because it said Sister B on the, on the program. And she said, I didn't do it to you. That's what I want to start with. I didn't do it to you. But for all of you that are hurt and harmed by the women in my profession, I want to apologize. And that was the healing I'd been waiting for 17 years from the church and from the nuns. And it just was a healing. It washed over me and 
cliche terms, it just washed over me. I was free from that burden, that anger of religion. I did a Bible study as a result of that for three years, and I didn't have contempt prior to investigation anymore. I had contempt after investigation. (laughs) But (laughs) it was really helpful. (laughs) It was really helpful. For anyone that's new... Alcoholics Anonymous, I invite you to join AA. You get out of what you put into it, and there's a lot of people that need your help. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 